Part four, book two of From the Founding of the City, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Foundation of the City, Volume One by Titus Livius, translated by George Baker. Book two, part four. The Romans were now on one side giving way when Marcus Valerius, brother of Publicola, observing young Tarquinius with ostentatious fierceness, exhibiting his prowess in the front of the exiles, and inflamed with the desire of supporting the glory of his house, and that those who enjoyed the honor of having expelled the royal family might also be signalized by their destruction, set spurs to his horse, and with his javelin presented, made towards Tarquinius. Tarquinius avoided this violent adversary by retiring into the body of his men and Valerius rashly pushed forward into the line of the exiles, was attacked and run through, by some person on one side of him, and as the horse's speed was in no degree checked by the wound of the rider, the expiring Roman sunk to the earth, his arms falling over his body. Postumius, the dictator, seeing a man of such rank slain, the exiles advancing to the charge with fierce impetuosity, his own men disheartened and giving way, issued orders to his cohort, a chosen band which he kept about his person as a guard, that they should treat as an enemy every man of their own army whom they should see retreating. Meeting danger thus on both sides, the Romans, who were flying, faced about against the enemy and renewed the fight. The dictator's cohort then for the first time engaged in battle, and, with fresh strength and spirits, falling on the exiles who were exhausted with fatigue, made great slaughter of them. On this occasion, another combat between two general officers took place. The Latine general, on seeing the cohort of exiles almost surrounded by the Roman dictator, ordered several companies from his reserve to follow him instantly to the front. Titus Hermenius, a lieutenant general, observing these as they marched up, and among them knowing Mamilius, who was distinguished by his dress and arms, encountered him with a strength so much superior to what had been shown a little before by the master of the horse, that with one blow he slew Mamilius, driving the spear through his side. Thus was he victorious, but having received a wound from a javelin while he was stripping the armor from his adversary's body, he was carried off to the camp and expired during the first dressing of it. The dictator then flew to the cavalry, entreating them, as the infantry were now fatigued, to dismount and support the engagement. They obeyed his orders, leaped from their horses, flew forward to the van, and covering themselves with their targets, took post as the front line. This instantly revived the courage of the infantry, who saw the young men of the first distinction foregoing every advantage in their manner of fighting, and taking an equal share of the danger. By these means the Latines were at length overpowered. Their troops were beaten from their ground, and began to retreat. The horses were then brought up to the cavalry, in order that they might pursue the enemy, and the line of infantry followed. At this juncture the dictator, omitting no means of engaging the aid both of gods and men, is said to have vowed a temple to Castor, and to have proclaimed rewards to the first and to the second of the soldiers who should enter the enemy's camp. And so great was the ardor of the Romans, that they never remitted the impetuosity of the charge by which they had broken the enemy's line, until they made themselves masters of the camp. Such was the engagement at the Lake Regilius. The dictator and master of the horse, on their return to the city, were honored with a triumph. During the three ensuing years there was neither war, nor yet a security of lasting peace. The consuls were Quintus Coelius, Titus Lartius, then Aulus Sempronius and Marcus Minutius, in whose consulate the temple of Saturn was dedicated, and the festival called Saturnalia instituted. After them, Aulus Postumius and Titus Reginius were made consuls. I find it asserted by some writers that the battle at the Lake Regilius was not fought until this year, and that Aulus Postumius, because the fidelity of his colleague was doubtful, abdicated the consulship, and was then made dictator. Such perplexing mistakes, with regard to dates, occur from the magistrates being ranged in different order, by different writers, that it is impossible, at this distance of time, when not only the facts, but the authors who relate them, are involved in the obscurity of antiquity, to trace out a regular series of the consuls as they succeeded each other, 
or in the transactions as they occurred in each particular year. Appius Claudius and Publius Servilius were next appointed to the consulship. This year was rendered remarkable by the news of Tarquinius's death. He died at Cumae, whither, on the reduction of the power of the Latines, he had retired for refuge, to the tyrant Astrodemus. By this news, both the patricians and the commons were highly elated, but the former suffered their exultation on the occasion to carry them to unwarrantable lengths, and the latter, who, until that time, had been treated with the utmost deference, began to feel themselves exposed to insults from the nobility. During the same year, the colony of Signia, which Tarquinius had founded in his reign, was re-established by filling up its number of colonists. The tribes of Rome were increased to the number of twenty-one. The Temple of Mercury was dedicated on the Ides of May. During these proceedings against the Latines, it could hardly be said that there was either war or peace with the nation of the Volscians. For, on the one hand, these had got troops in readiness, which they would have sent to the assistance of the Latines, if the Roman dictator had not been so quick in his measures. And on the other, the Roman had used this expedition in order that he might not be obliged to contend against the united forces of the Latines and Volscians. In resentment of this behavior, the consuls led the legions into the Volscian territory. The Volscians, who had no apprehensions of punishment for a design which had not been put in execution, were confounded at this unexpected proceeding, insomuch that, lying aside all thoughts of opposition, they gave three hundred hostages, the children of the principal persons at Cora and Pometia, in consequence whereof the legions were withdrawn from thence, without having come to an engagement. However, in a short time after, the Volscians, being delivered from their fears, resumed their former dispositions, renewed secretly their preparations for war, and prevailed on the Hernicians to join them. They also sent ambassadors through every part of Latium to stir up that people to arms. But the Latines were so deeply affected by their recent disaster at the Lake Regilius, and so highly incensed at any persons attempting to persuade them to engage in a war, that they even offered violence to the ambassadors. Seizing the Volscians, they conducted them to Rome, and there delivered them to the consuls, with information that the Volscians and Hernicians were preparing to make war on the Romans. The affair being laid before the Senate, the conduct of the Latines was so acceptable to the senators that they restored to them six thousand of the prisoners, and made an order, besides, that the new magistrates should proceed in the business relative to an alliance, a point which had been almost absolutely refused them. The Latines then highly applauded themselves for the part which they had acted, and the friends of peaceful measures were held in high estimation. They sent to the capital a golden crown, as a present to Jupiter, and together with the ambassadors and the present came a great multitude of attendants, consisting of the prisoners who had been sent back to their friends. These proceeded to the several houses of the persons, with whom each of them had been in servitude, returned thanks for their generous behavior and treatment of them during the time of their calamity, and formed mutual connections of hospitality. Never at any former time was the Latine nation more closely united to the Roman government, both by ties of a public and private nature. But besides being immediately threatened with the Volscian War, the state itself was torn in pieces by intestine animosities between the patricians and the commons on account principally of persons confined for debt. These complained loudly that after fighting abroad for freedom and empire, they were made prisoners and oppressed by their countrymen at home, and that the liberty of the commons was more secure in war than in peace, amongst their foes than amongst their own countrymen. This spirit of discontent, of itself increasing daily, was kindled into a flame by the extraordinary sufferings of one man, a person far advanced in years, whose appearance denoted severe distress, threw himself into the forum. His garb was squalid, and the figure of his person still more shocking, pale, and emaciated to the last degree. Besides, a long beard and hair had given his countenance a savage appearance. Wretched as was the plight in which he appeared, he was known notwithstanding. Several declared that he had been centurion in the army, and, filled with compassion for him, mentioned publicly many other distinctions which he had obtained in the service. He himself exhibited scars on his breast as testimonies of his honorable behavior in several actions, 
to those who inquired the cause of that wretched condition, both of his person and apparel, a crowd meantime having assembled round him which resembled in some degree an assembly of the people, he answered that, while he served in the army during the Sabine War, having not only lost the produce of his farm by the depredations of the enemy, but his house being burnt, all his goods plundered, his cattle driven off, and a tax being imposed at a time so distressing to him, he was obliged to run in debt, and this debt, aggravated by usury, had consumed first his farm, which he had inherited from his father and grandfather, then the remainder of his substance, and lastly, like a pestilence, had reached his person, that he had been dragged by a creditor, not into servitude, but into a house of correction, or rather a place of execution. He then showed his back, disfigured with the marks of fresh stripes. On this sight, after such a relation, a great uproar arose, and the tumult was no longer confined to the forum, but spread through every part of the city. Those who were then in confinement, and those who had been released from it, forced their way into public street, and implored the protection of their fellow citizens. There was no spot which did not afford a voluntary associate to add to the insurrection. From all quarters they ran in bodies, through every street, with great clamor, into the forum. The situation of the senators who happened to be there at that time, and who fell in the way of this mob, became highly perilous, for they would certainly have proceeded to violence, had not the consuls, Publius Servilius and Appius Claudius, hastily interposed their authority. To them the multitude turned their applications, showed their chains and other marks of wretchedness, said, this is what they had deserved, and reminded them of their former services in war, and in various engagements, insisted, with menaces rather than supplications, that they should assemble the Senate. They then placed themselves round the Senate House, that they might act as witnesses and directors of the councils of government. A very small number of the senators, whom chance threw in the way, and these against their will, attended the consuls. Fear kept the rest at a distance, so that nothing could be done by reason of the thinness of the meeting. The populace then conceived an opinion that there was a design to elude their demands by delay, that the absence of certain of the senators was occasioned, not by chance, nor by fear, but by their wishes to obstruct the business, that the consuls themselves showed a backwardness, and that their miseries were manifestly made a matter of mockery. The affair had now nearly arrived at such a state that even the majesty of the consuls, it was feared, might be insufficient to restrain the rage of the people. At length the senators, beginning to doubt whether they should incur the greater danger by absenting themselves, or by attending, came to the senate, and when, after this delay, a proper number had assembled, not only the senator, but even the consuls themselves, differed widely in opinion. Appius, a man of violent temper, thought that the riot ought to be quelled by the weight of the consular authority, that when one or two were taken into custody, the rest would be quiet. Servilius, more inclined to gentle remedies, maintained that, as the people's spirits were already wound up to such a pitch of ill-humor, it would be the safer and the easier method to bend than to break them. To add to these perplexities, they were threatened with still greater peril from another quarter. Some Latine horsemen arrived, in the utmost haste, with the alarming intelligence that the Volscians, in hostile array, were coming to attack the city, which news, so entirely opposite were the views of the parties into which the state was split, affected the patricians and the commons in a very different manner. The commons exulted with joy, said the gods were coming to take vengeance for the tyranny of the patricians, and encouraged each other in the resolution not to enroll themselves, saying, it was better that all should perish together than that they should be the only victims. Let the patricians serve as soldiers, let the patricians take arms, that those who reap the advantages of war may also undergo its severities and hazards. On the other hand, the Senate, dejected and confounded on finding themselves thus encompassed by dangers from their countrymen on one side and from the enemy on the other, besought the consul Civilius, whose temper was adapted to conciliate the regard of the people, that he should find means to extricate the commonwealth from the dreadful apprehensions with which it was beset. Whereupon the consul, dismissing the senate, went forth to the assembly of the people. There he assured them that the senators were solicitous that care should be taken of the interest of the commons, but that their fears for the safety 
of the commonwealth in general had interrupted their deliberations concerning that part of the state which though it must be allowed to be the largest was still but a part nor could they while the enemy was just at the gates allow any business to take place of the necessary provisions for the war even if they were allowed a little respite would it be either for the honor of the commons to have refused to take arms in defense of their country unless on condition of receiving hire for it nor could it fail of injuring the reputation of the senators themselves if they should appear to have now applied their attention to the good of their countrymen through fear rather than afterwards through inclination he gave proof of his sincerity of this discourse by an edict whereby he ordained that no person should hold any roman citizen in bonds or confinement so as to prevent his giving in his name to the consuls that no person should take possession or make sales of the goods of a soldier while upon service nor detain in custody either his children or grandchildren on the publication of this edict such debtors under arrest as were present instantly gave in their names and crowds of others in every part of the city rushing out of their confinement when their creditors had no longer a right to detain them ran together to the forum to take the military oath these composed a large body of troops and none during the Volscian war displayed a greater share of bravery and activity the consul led out his army against the enemy and pitched his camp at a small distance from theirs the following night the Volscians, expecting great advantages from the dissensions of the romans approached their camp in hopes that in the surrounding darkness some might desert or betray their posts they were however perceived by the sentinels the troops were called up and the signal being given they ran to arms and by these means frustrated the attempt of the Volscians. the remainder of the night was dedicated to repose by both parties next day at the first dawn the Volscians, having filled up the trenches assaulted the rampart and were proceeding to demolish the fortifications on either side when the consul having delayed for some time in order to try the temper of his men though called on from all sides and particularly by the debtors to give the signal at length on finding their ardor so great issued the order for sallying and sent forth his troops eager for the fight at the first onset the enemy were immediately routed and their rear harassed in their retreat as far as the infantry were able to pursue while the cavalry not suffering them to recover from their consternation drove them to their camp in a little time the camp itself was surrounded by the legions and the Volscians, not having courage enough left to make a stand there it was taken and plundered next day the legions were led in suessa pometia whither the enemy had retreated and shortly after the town was taken and given up to the troops to be plundered by these means the needy soldiers were in some measure relieved the consul having acquired great glory led back his victorious army to rome as he was preparing for his departure ambassadors came to him from the volscians of ectria who after the taking of pometia felt apprehensions for their own safety these had peace granted them by the decree of the senate but were deprived of their lands immediately after the sabines also caused an alarm at rome but it was in fact a tumult rather than a war an account was brought by night to the city that a sabine army were plundering the country and had advanced so far as the river Anio, and that they were ravaging and burning all the farms in that neighborhood. Aulus Postumius, who had been dictator in the Latine War, was instantly dispatched thither with all the cavalry, and the consul Servilius followed with the chosen body afoot. The greater part of the stragglers were cut off by the cavalry, nor was the main body of the Sabines capable of resisting the infantry on their approach, fatigued both by their march and by collecting booty. A great number of them in the country houses, overcharged with meat and wine, had scarcely strength sufficient to enable them to fly. Thus was this Sabine war finished within the same night in which the first account of it had been received. The next day, while sanguine hopes were entertained that peace with all their neighbors was now securely established, ambassadors came to the Senate from the Arucians, denouncing war unless the troops were withdrawn from the territory of the Volscians. The army of the Arunchians had set out from home, at the same time with the ambassadors, and intelligence arriving that it had been seen not far from Arichia, it excited such an alarm among the Romans, that neither could the Senate be consulted in a regular manner, nor could they, while busy in taking up arms, 
give a peaceable answer to those who were advancing against them. The troops marched to Arikia, and not far from thence, meeting with the enemy, came to a general engagement, which, without further contest, put an end to the war. End of Book Two, Part Four Part Five, Book Two of From the Founding of the City, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Foundation of the City, Volume One, by Titus Livius. Translated by George Baker. Book Two, Part Five. When the Aruncians were defeated, the Romans, having vanquished so many different powers, within the space of a few days, expected the fulfillment of the promises made them by the consuls, and strengthened by the engagements of the Senate. But Appius, instigated both by his own natural haughtiness and a desire to undermine the credit of his colleague, issued decrees on suits between debtor and creditor, with all possible severity, in consequence of which, both those who had formerly been in confinement were delivered up to their creditors, and others also were taken into custody. When this happened to be the cast of nay of the auditors, he appealed to the other consul. A crowd gathered about Servilus, reminded him of his promises, upbraided him with their services in war, and the scars which they had received, insisted that he should lay the affair before the Senate, and that as consul he should support his countrymen, and as general his soldiers. The consul was affected by these remonstrances, but circumstances obliged him to decline interfering, not only his colleague, but the whole faction of the nobles, having gone so violently into opposite measures. By thus acting a middle part, he neither avoided the hatred of the commons, nor procured the esteem of the patricians, the latter, considering him as destitute of the firmness becoming his office, and as too fond of popular applause, while the former looked upon him as a deceiver, and it shortly appeared that he was to become no less odious than Appius. A contest happened between the consuls, as to which of them should dedicate the temple of Mercury. The Senate refused to decide the matter, and referred it to the people, passing a vote that, to whichever of them the dedication should be granted, the same should preside over the markets, should institute a college of merchants, and join the pontiff in the performance of the ceremonies usual on such occasions. The people gave the honor of the dedication to Marcus Detorius, a centurion of the first rank, showing plainly that they acted thus, not merely out of respect to the person on whom they conferred an office of higher dignity than became his station, but with design to affront the consuls. This threw the patricians, and one of the consuls particularly, into a rage, but the commons had now assumed a greater degree of courage, and began to prosecute the measures in a very different method from that in which they had set out. Having given up all hope of protection from the consuls and the senate, whenever they saw a debtor led to the court, they flew together from all quarters, so that neither could the sentence of the consul be heard amidst their noise and clamors, nor when it was pronounced did any one obey it. All was managed by force, and the whole dread and danger, with respect to their freedom, was transferred from the debtors to the creditors, who, standing single, were abused by the multitude, under the very eye of the consul. To add to the perplexity of the Senate the alarm was spread of an attack being intended by the Sabines, and orders being issued for levying troops. Not a man gave in his name. Meanwhile Appius, in a rage, inveighed bitterly against the criminal lenity of his colleague, saying that by his popular silence he was betraying the commonwealth, and that besides refusing to enforce the laws with respect to creditors, he neglected also to execute the decree of the Senate for levying troops. He declared that the interest of the state was not yet entirely deserted, nor the consular office yet stripped of its authority, that he himself would stand forth singly and vindicate his own dignity and that of the state. Though surrounded by the multitude which assembled daily, and were of a temper too violent to be controlled, he ordered one of the principal ringleaders of the mob to be apprehended. When the lictors laid hold of him he appealed, but the consul would not at first allow the appeal, there being no doubt what the sentence of the people would be. His obstinacy, however, was at length overcome, 
more by the advice and influence of the nobility than by the clamors of the people. So firmly did he withstand the indignation of the multitude. From this time the evil daily gained ground, showing itself not only in open expressions of discontent, but what was much more pernicious, in secret meetings and private cabals. At length these consuls, so odious to the people, went out of office, Appius in high favor with the patricians, Servilius with neither party. Next entered on the consulship Aulus Virginius and Titus Vetusius. The people now, not being able to judge what sort of consuls they were to have, took care to form nightly meetings, some on the Esquiline, others on the Aventine Mount, in order that their proceedings might not be confused by their being obliged to adopt measures hastily in the forum, and to act on every occasion at random, and without a plan. The consuls, considering this as a very dangerous proceeding, which it really was, proceeded to the consideration of the Senate, but were not allowed, after proposing it, to take the votes regularly, a great tumult arising on the mention of it among the senators, who exclaimed, and expressed the highest indignation at the consuls attempting to throw on that body the odium of an affair which ought to have been quelled by the consular authority. They told them that, if there really had been magistrates in the commonwealth, there would have been no council at Rome but the public one. At present the government was divided and dispersed into a thousand senate houses, and assemblies, some meetings being held on the Esquiline Mount, others on the Aventine. That they had no doubt but one man, such as Appius Claudius, would have dispersed these meetings in a moment's time. The consuls, on receiving this rebuke, asked the senate, what then they would have them do? For they were resolved, they said, to act with the activity and vigor which the Senate might recommend. A decree then passed, that they should enforce the levies with utmost strictness, for that the commons were grown insolent through want of employment. Dismissing the Senate, the consuls mounted the tribunal, and cited the younger citizens by their name. No answer being made, the multitude which stood round, like a general assembly, declared that the commons could be no longer deceived, and that not a single soldier should be raised until the public engagements were fulfilled, that every man must have his liberty restored, before arms were put into his hands, that the people might be convinced they were to fight for their country and fellow-citizens, not for their masters. The consuls saw clearly enough what the Senate expected from them, but of those who spoke with the greatest vehemence within the walls of the Senate-house, not one was present to stand the brunt of the contests, and everything threatened a desperate one with the commons. It was resolved, therefore, before they should proceed to extremities, to consult the Senate again, the consequence of which was, that all the younger senators rushed up hastily to the seats of the consuls, desiring them to abdicate the consulship, and lay down a command which they wanted spirit to support. Having made sufficient trial of the dispositions of both sides, the consuls at length spoke out, Conscript fathers, lest ye should hereafter say that ye were not forewarned, know that a dangerous sedition is ready to break out. We demand that those who are the most forward to censure us for inactivity may assist us by their presence, while we hold the levy. We will proceed in the business in such a manner as shall be approved by the most strenuous advocates for vigorous measures, since such is your pleasure. They then went back to the tribunal, and ordered, purposely, one of those who were within view to be cited, finding that he stood mute, and that a number of people had formed in a circle round him, to prevent any force being used. The consuls sent a lictor to him, who, being driven back, those of the senators who attended the councils, exclaimed against the insolence of such behavior, flew down from the tribunal to assist the lictor. The populace then, quitting the lictor, to whom they had offered no other direction than that of hindering him from making the seizure, directed their force against the senators, but the consuls interposing quickly put an end to the scuffle, in which, as neither stones nor weapons had been used, there was more clamor and rage than mischief. The Senate, called tumultuously together, proceeded in a manner still more tumultuous, those who had been beaten, demanding an inquiry into the affair, and the most violent of them endeavoring to carry their point by clamor and noise, rather than by vote. At length, when their rage had somewhat subsided, the consuls, reproaching them with being equally disorderly in the Senate House as in the Forum, began to collect the votes. There were three different opinions. Publius Virginius thought that the case did not extend to the whole body of the commons, and that those only were to be considered, 
who, relying on the promises of the consul Publius Servilius, had served in the Volscian, Aruncian, and Sabine wars. Titus Largius was of opinion that the present juncture required something more than the making of return for services performed, that the whole body of the commons were overwhelmed with debt, nor could the progress of evil be stopped, unless the advantages of the whole were attended to. On the contrary, if distinctions were made, this would add fuel to the dissensions, instead of extinguishing them. Appius Claudius, whose temper was naturally harsh, was roused to a degree of ferocity by his hatred to the commons on the one hand, and the applause of the patricians on the other, affirmed that all these disturbances were excited, not by the people's sufferings, but their licentiousness, and that the commons were actuated by a spirit of wantonness, rather than by resentment of injuries. This was the consequence of giving them a right to appeal, for all that a consul could do was to threaten. He could not command, when people are allowed to appeal to those who have been accomplices in their transgressions. Come, said he, let us create a dictator, from whom there is no appeal. This madness, which has set the whole state in a flame, will quickly sink into silence. Let me see, then, who will strike a lictor, when he knows that the very person whose dignity he insults has the sole and entire disposal of his person and of his life. To many, the expedient recommended by Appius appeared too rough and violent, and justly so. On the other hand, the propositions of Virginius and Largius were considered as tending to establish a bad precedent, particularly that of Largius, which was utterly subversive of all credit. The advice of Virginius was deemed to be the farthest from excess on either side, and a just medium between the other two. But through the spirit of faction, and men's regard to their private interests, things which ever did and ever will impede the public councils, Appius prevailed, and was himself very near being created dictator, which proceeding beyond any other would have highly disgusted the commons at a very critical juncture, when the Volscians, the Equians, and the Sabines happened to be all in arms at the same time. But the consuls and the elder part of the senate took care that a command, in itself uncontrollable, should be entrusted to a person of a mild disposition, and accordingly they chose for dictator Manius Valerius, son of Volusus. Although the commons saw that the dictator was created in opposition to them, yet, as by his brother's law, they enjoyed the privilege of appeal, they dreaded nothing harsh or overbearing from that family. Their hopes were farther encouraged by an edict which the dictator published, of the same tenor in general with the edict of the consul Servilius. But as they thought that they had now securer grounds of confidence, both in the man himself and in the power with which he was invested, they desisted from the contest, and gave in their names. Ten legions were completed, a force greater than had ever been raised before. Of these, three were assigned to each of the consuls, the other four were commanded by the dictator. War could now be no longer deferred. The Equians had invaded the territories of the Latines, and these by their ambassadors petitioned the Senate, that they would either send troops to protect them, or permit them to take arms themselves to defend their frontiers. It was judged the safer method to defend the Latines without their own assistance, than to allow them to handle arms again. The consul Vetusius was therefore sent thither, who put an end to the depredations. The Equians retired from the plains, and provided for their safety on the tops of the mountains, relying more on the situation than on their arms. The other consul who marched against the Volscians, not choosing that his time should be wasted in like manner, used every means, particularly by ravaging the country, in order to provoke the enemy to approach nearer, and to hazard an engagement. They were drawn up in order of battle in a plain between the two camps, each party before their own rampart. The Volscians had considerably the advantage in point of numbers. They therefore advanced to the fight in a careless manner, as if despising the enemy. The Roman consul did not suffer his troops to move, nor to return the shout, but ordered them to stand with their javelins fixed in the ground, and as soon as the enemy should come within reach, then to exert at once their utmost efforts, and decide the affair with their swords. The Volscians, fatigued with running and shouting, rushed upon the Romans, whom they believed to be benumbed with fear, but when they found a vigorous resistance, and the swords glittering before their eyes, struck with consternation, just as if they had fallen into an ambuscade, they turned their backs, nor had they strength left to enable them to make their escape, having exhausted it by advancing to the battle in full speed. The Romans, on the other hand, 
having stood quiet during the first part of the engagement, had their vigor fresh, and easily overtaking the wearied fugitives, took their camp by assault, and pursuing them, as they fled from thence to Velitre, the victors and the vanquished composing, as it were, but one body, rushed into the city together. People of every kind were put to the sword without distinction, and there was more blood spilt than even in the fight. A small number only who threw down their arms obtained quarter. While these things passed in the country of the Volskians, the Sabines, who were by far the most formidable enemy, were routed, put to flight, and beaten out of their camp by the dictator. He had at first, by a charge of his cavalry, thrown the centre of the enemy's line into disorder, which, while they extended their wings too far, had not been sufficiently strengthened by a proper depth of files. Before they could recover from this confusion, the infantry fell upon them and continued their attack, without intermission, until they made themselves masters of their camp, and put a conclusion to the war. Since the battle at the Lake Regulus, there had not been obtained in those times a more glorious victory than this. The dictator entered the city in triumph, and besides the accustomed honors, there was a place in the circus assigned to him and his posterity, for a seat, and a curule chair fixed in it. From the vanquished Volskians the lands of the district of Velitre were taken, for which inhabitants were sent from the city, and a colony established there. Soon after this, a battle was fought with the Equians, against the inclination indeed of the consul, who considered the disadvantage of the ground which the troops had to traverse. But the soldiers, accusing him of protracting the business, in order that the dictator might go out of office before they should return to the city, and so his promises fall to the ground without effect, as had those of the former consul, they at length prevailed on him to march up his army, at all hazards, against the steep of the mountain. Rash as this undertaking was, yet through the cowardice of the enemy it was crowned with success, for before a weapon could be drawn, struck with amazement at the boldness of the Romans, they abandoned their camp, which they had fixed in a very strong position, and ran down precipitately into the valleys, on the opposite side. There the Romans gained a bloodless victory, and an abundance of booty. Though their arms were thus attended with success, in three different quarters, neither the patricians nor commons were free from anxiety respecting the issue of their domestic affairs. With such powerful influence, and with such art also, had the lenders of money concerted their measures, that they were able to disappoint not only the commons, but even the dictator himself. For Valerius, on the return of the council of Atusius, took care that the first business which came before the senate should be that of the people, who had returned home victorious, and proposed the question, what did they think proper to be done with respect to the persons confined for debt? And when they refused to take the matter into consideration, he said, My endeavors to restore concord are, I see, displeasing to you. Believe me when I solemnly declare that the time will shortly come when you will wish that the commons of Rome had just such patrons as I am. As to myself, I will neither be the means of farther disappointments to the hopes of my countrymen, nor will I hold the office of dictator without effect." intestine discord and foreign wars made it necessary for the commonwealth to have such a magistrate. Peace has been procured abroad. At home it is not suffered to take place. It is my determination, then, in time of sedition, to appear in the character of a private citizen, rather than that of dictator. Then withdrawing from the Senate House, he abdicated the dictatorship. The case appeared to the commons as if he had resigned his office out of resentment of the treatment shown to them, and therefore, as if he had fulfilled his engagements. It not having been his fault that they were not fulfilled, they attended him, as he retired to his house, with approbation and applause. Part six, End of Book, book two, two of From the five. Founding of the City, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Foundation of the City, Volume One, by Titus Livius. Translated by George Baker. Book Two, Part Six. The Senate were then seized with apprehensions that if the citizens should be discharged from the army, their secret cabals and conspiracies would be renewed. Wherefore, supposing that, though the levy was made by the dictator, yet as the soldiers had sworn obedience to the councils, they were still bound by that oath, they ordered the legions, under the pretext of hostilities being renewed by the Equians, to be led out of the city which step served only to hasten the breaking out of the sedition. It is said that the plebeians, at first entertained thoughts of putting the consuls to death, 
in order that they might be thereby discharged from the oath, but being afterwards informed that no religious obligation could be dissolved by an act of wickedness, they, by the advice of a person called Sicinus, retired without waiting for orders from the councils to the sacred mount, beyond the river Arno, about three miles from the city. This account is more generally credited than that given by Piso, who says, the secession was made to the Aventine. In this place, without any commander, having fortified their camp with a rampart and trench, they remained quiet for several days, taking nothing from any one but necessary subsistence, neither receiving nor giving offence. Great was the consternation in the city, all was fearful suspense and mutual apprehension. The plebeians, who were left behind by their brethren, dreaded the violence of the patricians. The patricians dreaded the plebeians who remained in the city, not knowing whether they ought to wish for their stay or for their departure. But how long could it be supposed that the multitude which had seceded would remain inactive? And what would be the consequence, if in the meantime a foreign war should break out? No glimpse of hope could they see left, except in concord between the citizens, which must be re-established in the state on any terms, whether fair or unfair. They determined, therefore, to send as ambassador to the plebeians Meninius Agrippa, a man of eloquence, and acceptable to the commons, because he had been originally one of their body. He, being admitted into the camp, is said to have related to them the following fable, delivered in an antiquated language and an uncouth style. At a time when the members of the human body did not, as at present, all unite in one plan, but each member had its own scheme, and its own language, the other parts were provoked at seeing that the fruits of all their care, of all their toil and service, were applied to the use of the belly, and that the belly meanwhile remained at its ease, and did nothing but enjoy the pleasure provided for it. On this they conspired together, that the hand should not bring food to the mouth, nor the mouth receive it if offered, nor the teeth chew it. While they wished, by these angry measures, to subdue the belly through hunger, the members themselves, and the whole body, were together with it reduced to the last stage of decay. From thence it appeared that the office of the belly itself was not confined to a slothful indolence, that it could not only receive nourishment, but supply it to the others, conveying to every part of the body that blood on which depend our life and vigor, by distributing it equally through the veins, after having brought it to perfection by digestion of the food. Applying this to the present case, and showing what similitude there was between the dissension of the members, and the resentment of the commons against the patricians, he made a considerable impression on the people's minds. A negotiation was then opened for a reconciliation, and an accommodation was effected, on the terms that the plebeians should have magistrates of their own, invested with invaluable privileges, who might have power to afford them protection against the consuls, and that it should not be lawful for any of the patricians to hold that office. Accordingly, there were two tribunes of the commons created, Caius Licinius and Lucius Albinius, and these created three colleagues to themselves, among whom was Sicinius, the adviser of the secession, but who the other two were, is not agreed. Some say that there were only two tribunes created on the sacred mount, and that the devoting law was passed there. During the secession of the commons, Spurius Cassius and Posthumus Cominius entered on the consulship. In their consulate the treaty with the Latines was concluded. For the purpose of ratifying this, one of the consuls remained at Rome, and the other being sent with an army against the Volscians, defeated and put to flight those of Antium, and having driven them into the town of Longula, pursued the blow, and made himself master of the town. He afterwards took Polusca, another town belonging to the same people, then with all his force attacked Corioli. There was in the camp, among others of the young nobility, Caius Marcius, a youth of quick judgment and lively courage, who was afterwards surnamed Cariolanus. The Roman army, while engaged in the siege of Corioli, applying their whole attention to the garrison, which they kept shut up in the town, without any fear of an attack from without, were assaulted on a sudden by the Volscian legions, who had marched thither from Antium, and at the same time the enemy sallied out from the town. Marcius happened to be then on guard, and being supported by a chosen body of men, he not only repelled the attack of the sallying party, but rushed furiously in at the open gate, and putting all to the sword in that part of the city, laid hold of the first fire which he found, 
and threw it on the houses adjoining the wall, on which the shouts of the townsmen mingling with the cries of the women and children, occasioned by the first fright, served both to add courage to the Romans, and to dispirit the Volscians, as they perceived that the town was taken which they had come to relieve. By this means the Volscians of Antium were defeated, and the town of Corioli taken, and so entirely did the glory of Marcius eclipse the fame of the consul, that were it not the treaty with the Latines being engraved on a brazen pillar, remained to testify that it was ratified by Spurius Cassius alone, the other consul being absent, it would not have been remembered that Posthumus Cominius was appointed to conduct the war. This year died Menenius Agrippa, through the whole course of his life equally beloved by the patricians and the plebeians, and after the secession still more endeared to the latter. This man, who, in the character of mediator and umpire, had re-established concord among his countrymen, the ambassador of the senate to the plebeians, the person who brought back the Roman commons to the city, was not possessed of property sufficient for the expense of a funeral. He was buried at the charge of the commons, by a contribution of a sextons from each person. The consuls who succeeded were Titus Griganius and Publius Minucius. During this year, when the state was undisturbed by foreign wars, the dissensions at home had been healed. A more grievous calamity of another nature fell upon it. At first a scarcity of provisions, occasioned by the lands lying untilled during the secession of the commons, and afterwards a famine, not less severe than what is felt in a besieged city. This without doubt would have increased to such a degree that the slaves, and also many of the commons, must have perished, had not the consuls taken measures to remedy it, by sending to all quarters to buy up corn, not only into Etruria on the coast to the right of Ostia, and by permission of the Volscians along the coast on the left as far as Cumae, but even to Sicily, for the hatred entertained against them by their neighbours compelled them thus to look for aid to distant countries. After a quantity of corn had been purchased at Cumae, the ships were detained by the tyrant Aristodemus, as the property of the Tarquini, whose heir he was. Among the Volscians, and in the Pomptine district, it could not even be purchased, the persons employed in that business being in danger of their lives from the violence of the inhabitants. From Etruria some corn was conveyed by the Tiber, by which the people were subordinated. At this unseasonable time, while thus distressed by the scarcity, they were in danger of being farther harassed by war, had not a most destructive pestilence attacked the Volscians, when they were just ready to commence hostilities. By this dreadful calamity the enemy were so dispirited, that even after it had abated, they could not entirely rid their minds of the terror which it had occasioned. Besides, the Romans not only augmented the numbers in their settlement at Villetre, but sent a new colony into the mountains of Norba, to serve as a barrier in the Pomptine territory. In the succeeding consulate of Marcus Minucius and Aulus Sempronius, a great quantity of corn was brought from Sicily, and it was debated in the Senate at what price it should be given to the commons. Many were of opinion that now was the time to humble the commons, and to recover those rights which, by the secession and violence, had been extorted from the patricians. Marcius Coriolanus particularly, an avowed enemy of the power of the tribunes, said, If they wish to have provisions at the usual price, let them restore to the patricians their former rights. Why am I obliged, after being sent under the yoke, after being ransomed, as it were, from robbers, to behold plebeian magistrates, to behold Sicinius invested with power and authority? Shall I submit to such indignities longer than necessity compels me? Shall I, who could not endure Tarquinius on the throne, endure Sicinius? Let him now succeed. Let him call away the commons. The road is open to the sacred mount, and to the other hills." Let them carry off the corn from our lands, as they did two years ago. Let them make the best of the present state of the market, which they have occasioned by their own madness. I affirm with confidence that when they are brought to reason by their present sufferings, they will themselves become tillers of the lands, rather than take arms and succeed, to prevent their being tilled. Whether such a measure were expedient is not now easy to say, but in my opinion it was very practicable for the patricians, by insisting on terms for lowering the price of provisions, to have freed themselves from the tribunician power, and every other restraint imposed on them against their will. The method proposed appeared to the Senate to be too harsh, and incensed the commons to such a degree that they were very near having recourse to arms. They complained that, as if they were enemies, attempts were made to destroy them by famine, 
that they were defrauded of food and sustenance, that the foreign corn, the only support which, unexpectedly, fortune had given them, was to be snatched out of their mouths, unless the tribunes were surrendered up in bonds to Caius Marcius, unless he were gratified by the personal sufferings of the Roman commons. A new kind of executioner had come forward, who gave them no alternative but death or slavery. They would have proceeded to violence against him as he came out of the senate-house, had not the tribunes very opportunely summoned him to a trial. This suppressed their rage, when every one saw himself a judge, and empowered to decide on the life and death of his foe. At first Marcius heard the threats of the tribunes with scorn. The authority given to their office, he said, extended only to the affording protection, not to the inflicting of punishment. That they were tribunes of the commons, not of the patricians. But the whole body of the commons had taken up the cause with such implacable animosity that the patricians were under the necessity of devoting one victim to punishment for the general safety. They struggled, however, notwithstanding the weight of the public hatred which they had to contend with, and not only each particular member, but the whole collective body exerted their utmost efforts. And at first they tried, whether by posting their clients in divers places convenient for the purpose, they could not deter the several plebeians from attending the meetings and cabals, and thereby put a stop to farther proceedings. Afterwards they all came forth in a body, addressing the commons with entreaties and supplications. One would have thought that every patrician was going to stand his trial. They besought them, if they did not think proper to acquit Marcius as innocent, yet considering him as guilty, to grant as a favor, on their request, the pardon of one citizen, one senator. However, as he himself did not appear on the day appointed, they persisted in their resentment. He was condemned in his absence, and went into exile to the Volscians, uttering menaces against his country, and breathing already the resentment of an enemy. The Volscians received him kindly, and daily increased their attention and respect, in proportion as they had opportunities of observing the violence of his anger towards his countrymen, against whom he would often utter complaints and even threats. He lodged in the house of Adius Tullus, who was then the man of by far greatest consequence amongst the Volscians, and an inveterate enemy to the Romans, so that the one, being stimulated by an old animosity, the other by fresh resentment, they began to concert schemes for bringing about a war with Rome. They judged, however, that it would be a difficult matter to prevail on their people to take arms, which they had so often tried without success, that by the many wars which they had sustained at difficult times, and lately by the loss of their young men in the pestilence, their spirits were broken, and that it was necessary to make use of art, in order that their hatred, which had now lost its keenness through length of time, might be thereby wedded anew. It happened that preparations were then making at Rome for a repetition of the great games. The reason of repeating them was this. On the morning of the day when the games were to have been celebrated, before the shows began, a master of a family, after lashing his slave loaded with a neck yoke, had driven him across the middle of the circus. The games were afterwards exhibited, as if this affair had no relation to religion. Some short time after, Titus Atinius, a plebeian, had a dream. He imagined Jupiter to have said to him, that the dancer, who performed previously to the games, had been displeasing to him, and unless those games were repeated, and that in a magnificent manner, the city would be in danger, and ordered him to go and tell this to the consuls. Although the man's mind was under the influence of a considerable degree of superstition, yet the awe which he felt at the high dignity of the magistrates, and his own apprehensions, lest he should be treated by them, and the public, as an object of ridicule, overcame his religious fears. This delay cost him dear, for within a few days he lost his son, and lest the cause of that sudden disaster should be doubtful, while he was overwhelmed with grief, the same phantom appeared to him in his sleep, and seemed to ask him whether he had gotten a sufficient reward for the contempt of the deity, telling him that a still greater awaited him, unless he went immediately and delivered the message to the consuls. This made a deeper impression on his mind, and yet he hesitated and delayed, until at length he was attacked by a grievous disorder, a stroke of the palsy. He then submitted to the admonitions of the divine displeasure, and wearied out by his past sufferings, and the apprehension of others which threatened him, he called a council of his intimate friends, and after acquainting them with the several things which he had seen and heard, and with Jupiter's having appeared to him so often in his sleep, and likewise the anger and threats of the deity, so speedily fulfilled in the calamities which had befallen him, 
he was, in pursuance of the clear and unanimous opinion of all present, carried in a litter into the forum, to the councils, from thence he was conveyed by their order into the senate-house, where, when he had related the same accounts, to the utter astonishment of all, behold another miracle. It is recorded that he, who had been carried thither incapable of using any of his limbs, had no sooner discharged his duty, than he was able to walk home without assistance. The senate decreed that the games should be exhibited in the most splendid manner. To these games, in consequence of a plan laid by Attius Tullus, a vast number of the Volscians repaired. Before the commencement of the exhibition, Tullus, according to a scheme concerted at home with Marcius, came to the consuls, told them that he wished to confer with them, in private, on some matters which concerned the commonwealth, and every other person having retired, he addressed them thus. It is painful to me in the extreme, to say anything of my countrymen that is not to their honour. I do not come, however, to charge them with having committed any wrong act, but to guard against such being committed. That the disposition of our people are fickle, to a degree infinitely beyond what might be wished, numerous disasters have given sensible proofs. For to your forbearance it is owing, and not to our own deserts, that we have not been utterly destroyed. There are great numbers of the Volscians now in Rome. There are games to be celebrated. The public will be intent on the exhibition. I well remember the outrage which was committed in this city by the Sabine youths on a similar occasion. I shudder with apprehension, lest some inconsiderate and rash deed may ensue. Thus much I thought it my duty, both for our own sake and for yours, to mention beforehand to you, who are consuls. For my part, I intend instantly to return home, lest, if I should be present, my character might be stained with the imputation of some improper word or action. After this discourse he departed. The consuls proposed the matter to the consideration of the Senate, a matter, indeed, unsupported by proof, but yet coming from a person whose authority was of great weight. The authority, then, rather than any reason appearing in the case, as it often happens, determined them to use precautions, even though they might be unnecessary, and a decree being passed that the Volscians should retire from the city, criers were dispatched to every quarter, to order them all to remove before night. At first they were struck with great terror, as they ran up and down to their lodgings, to take away their effects. Indignation afterwards filled their minds, when they were beginning their journey. They considered themselves stigmatized as persons infamous and polluted, driven away from the converse of men and of gods, from public games on the day of a festival. End of Book 2, Part 6part seven book two of from the founding of the city volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org from the foundation of the city volume one by titus livius translated by george baker book two part seven as they formed in their journey almost one continued train tullus who had proceeded to the fountain of ferentina accosted the chief persons among them as each arrived, and by asking questions, and expressing indignation, while they greedily listened to expressions which favoured their resentment, led them on, and by their means, the rest of the multitude, to a plain that lay near the road, and there began to harangue them, as if at a general assembly. Although, said he, ye should forget all the injurious treatment which ye formerly received from the Roman people, the calamities of the Volscian race, and every other matter of the kind, with what degree of patience do ye bear this insult thrown on you, when they commence their games by exhibiting us to public ignominy? Did ye not perceive that they performed a triumph over you this day? That, as ye were retiring, ye served as a spectacle to all their citizens, to foreigners, to so many of the neighboring nations, that your wives and your children were led captives before the eyes of the public, what do you suppose were the sentiments of those who heard the words of the crier, of those who beheld you departing, or of those who met this disgraceful cavalcade? What else but that we must be some polluted wretches, whose presence at the shows would contaminate the games, and render an expiation necessary, and that therefore we were driven away from the mansions of a people of such purity of character, from their meeting and converse? And besides, does it not strike you, that we should not now be alive, if we had not hastened our departure, if indeed it ought to be called a departure, and not a flight. And do you not consider as enemies the inhabitants of that city, 
wherein, had ye delayed for one day, ye must, every one of you, have perished. It was a declaration of war against you, for which those who made it will suffer severely, if ye have the spirit of men. Their anger, which was hot before, was by this discourse kindled to a flame, in which temper they separated to their several homes, and each taking pains to rouse those of his own state to vengeance, they soon effected a general revolt of the whole Volscian nation. The commanders appointed for this war, by the unanimous choice of all the states, were Adius Tullus and Caius Marcius the Roman exile, on the latter of whom they reposed by far the greater part of their hopes. Nor did he disappoint their expectations, but gave a convincing proof that the commonwealth was once more indebted for power to its generals than to its troops. Marching to Circei, he first expelled the Roman colonists, and then delivered the city, after restoring it to freedom, into the hands of the Volscians. Turning thence across the country towards the Latine road, he deprived the Romans of their late acquisitions, Cetricum Longula, Polusca, and Corioli. He then took Lavinium, and afterwards made a conquest of Corbio, Vitellia, Trebia, Levisi, and Pedum, one after another. From Pedum, lastly, he led his forces towards Rome, and pitching his camp at the Clulian trenches, five miles from the city, sent parties to ravage the lands, at the same time appointing persons among the plunderers to take care that the possessions of the patricians should be left unmolested, either because his anger was levelled principally against the plebeians, or with the design of thereby causing a greater dissension between these different orders. And this would, no doubt, have been the consequence. So powerfully did the tribunes, by their invectives against the patricians, excite the resentment of the commons, which was sufficiently too violent before, but that, however full their minds were of mutual distrust and rancor, their dread of a foreign enemy, the strongest tie of concord, obliged them to unite. In one point only did they disagree, the senate and the consuls placing their hopes entirely in arms, the commons preferring all other measures to war. By this time Spurius Natius and Sextus Furius were consuls. While they were employed in reviewing the legions, and posting troops upon the walls, and in other places, where it was thought proper to fix guards and watches, a vast multitude of people assembling, and insisting on peace, terrified them, at first, by their seditious clamors, and at length compelled them to assemble the senate, and there proposed the sending of ambassadors to Caius Marcius. The senate, finding that they could not depend on the support of the commons, took the matter into consideration, and sent deputies to Marcius to treat of an accommodation. To these he replied in harsh terms, that if the lands were restored to the Volscians, a treaty might then be opened for an accommodation. But if they were resolved to enjoy, at their ease, what they had plundered from their neighbors in war, he would not forget either the injustice of his countrymen, or the kindness of his hosts, but would take such steps as should show the world that his courage was irritated by exile, not depressed. The same persons being sent a second time, were refused admittance into the camp. It is related that the priests, afterwards in their sacred vestments, went as suppliants to the camp of the enemy, but had no more influence on him than the ambassadors. The matrons then assembled in a body about Veturia, the mother of Coriolanus, and Volumnia his wife. Whether this was a scheme of government, or the result of the women's own fears, I cannot discover. It is certain that they carried their point and Veturia, who was far advanced in years, and Volumnia, leading two little sons whom she had by Marcius, went to the camp of the enemy, so that women, by tears and prayers, preserved the city which the men were not able to preserve by arms. When they arrived at the camp, and Coriolanus was informed that a great procession of women was approaching, he, who had not been moved, either by the majesty of the state, represented in its ambassadors, or by the awful address made by the ministers of religion, both to his sight and his understanding, at first resolved to show himself still more inflexible against female tears. But soon after, one of his acquaintance, knowing Veturia, who was distinguished above the rest by an extraordinary degree of sadness, as she stood between her daughter-in-law and grandchildren, said to him, "'Unless my eyes deceive me, your mother with your wife and children are coming.' Coriolanus, in a transport of amazement, and almost distracted, sprang from his seat to embrace his mother as she advanced, who, instead of entreaties, addressed him with angry reproofs. "'Let me know,' said she, 
before I receive your embrace, whether I am come to an enemy or to a son, whether I am in your camp a prisoner or a mother. Was it for this that age has been lengthened out, that I might behold you in exile and afterwards an enemy? Could you lay waste this land, which gave you birth and education, whatever degree of anger, whatever thirst of vengeance, might have occupied your mind on your march, did you not, on entering its borders, feel your passion subside? When you came within sight of Rome, did it not recur to you, within those walls are my house and guardian gods, my mother, my wife, my children? Had I never been a mother, then Rome would not have been now besieged. Had I not a son, I might have died free and left my country free, but for my part there is no suffering to which I can be exposed that will not reflect more dishonor on you than misery on me. And be my lot as wretched as it may, I am not to endure it long. Let these claim your regard, who, if you persist, can have no other prospect, but either untimely death or lasting slavery. His wife and children embraced him, and the whole crowd of women, uttering bitter lamentations and deploring their own and their country's fate, at length got the better of his obstinacy, so that, after embracing and dismissing his family, he removed his camp to a greater distance from the city. In a short time he drew off the troops entirely from the Roman territories, which is said to have incensed the Volscians so highly against him that he perished under the effects of their resentment. By what kind of death writers do not agree. In the account given by Fabius, the most ancient writer by far, I find that he lived even to old age. He mentions positively that when Marcius became far advanced in years, he used frequently to utter this remark, that the evils of exile bore much the heavier on the aged. The men of Rome were not sparing in bestowing on the women the honors which they had earned, so distant were the manners of that age from the practice of detracting from the merits of others. They even erected and dedicated a temple to female fortune, as a lasting monument of their meritorious conduct. The Volscians afterward, in conjunction with the Equians, made another inroad into the Roman territories, but the Equians soon became dissatisfied at being commanded by Adius Tullus, and in consequence of the dispute, whether the Volscians or the Equians should give a general to the combined army, a separation ensued, and soon after a furious battle. There the good fortune of the Roman people wasted the two armies of its enemies, in a contest no less bloody than obstinate. The consuls of the next year were Titus Sicinius and Caius Aquilus. The Volscians were allotted as a province to Sicinius. The Hernicians, for they were also in arms, to Aquilius. The Hernicians were subdued in that year. The operations against the Volscians ended without any advantage being gained on either side. The next consuls elected were Spurius Cassius and Proculus Virginius. A league was made with the Hernicians. Two-thirds of their lands were taken from them, one-half of which the consul Cassius intended to distribute among the Latines, the other half among the commons. To this donation he proposed to add a considerable tract of land, which belonged, he said, to the public, though possessed by private persons. Many of the patricians, who were themselves in possession of this land, were hereby alarmed for their property, and besides, that body in general was seized with anxiety for the safety of the people. Observing that the consul, by these donatives, was forming an influence at once dangerous to liberty and to right. This was the first proposal of the agrarian law, which from that time to the present age has never been agitated without the most violent commotions in the state. The other consul opposed the donations, and in this he was supported by the patricians. Nor did all the commons oppose him. At first they began to despise a gift which was not confined to themselves, but extended to the allies, in common with the citizens. Then they were accustomed to hear the consul Virginius in the assemblies frequently, as it were, prophesying, that the donatives of his colleagues were full of infectious poison, that those lands would bring slavery on such as should receive them, that he was paving the way to arbitrary power, for why should the allies and the Latin nation be thus included? What was the intent of restoring a third part of the lands taken in war to the Hernicians, who so lately were enemies, only that these nations might set Cassius at their head as a leader instead of Coriolanus. Whoever argued and protested against the agrarian law, as thus proposed, was sure of popularity, and from that time both the consuls vied with each other in humouring the commons. Virginius declared that he would allow the lands to be assigned, 
provided they were not made over to any other than citizens of Rome. Cassius, finding that, by his pursuit of popularity among the allies, which he had betrayed in the proposed distribution of the lands, he had lowered himself in the estimation of his countrymen, and hoping to recover their esteem by another donative, proposed in order that the money received for the Sicilian corn should be refunded to the people. But this the commons rejected with as much disdain as if he were avowedly bartering for arbitrary power. So strongly were they influenced by their inveterate suspicions of his ambition, that they spurned at all his presence, as if they were in a state of affluence, and no sooner did he go out of office than he was condemned and executed, as we are informed by undoubted authority. Some say that it was his father who inflicted this punishment on him, that having at home held an inquiry into his conduct, he scourged him and put him to death, and consecrated the allowance settled on his son, to Ceres, that out of this a statue was erected, with this inscription, given from the Cassian family. And it is the more credible account, that he was prosecuted for treason by the quaestors Caso Fabius and Lucius Valerius, that he was found guilty on a trial before the people, and his house raised by a public decree. It stood on the spot which is now the area before the temple of Telus. However, whether the trial was private or public, he was condemned in the consulate of Servius Cornelius and Quintus Fabius. The anger which the people had conceived against Cassius was not of long continuance. The alluring prospects held out by the agrarian law were sufficient of themselves, now the proposer of it was removed out of the way, to make a lively impression on their minds, and their eagerness in pursuit of them was inflamed by an act of unreasonable parsimony in the patricians, who, when the Volscians and Equians were vanquished in that year, deprived the troops of the booty. The whole of what was taken from the enemy, the consul Fabius sold, and lodged the produce of it in the treasury. The name of Fabius was odious to the commons, on account of this conduct, yet the patricians had influence enough to procure the election of Caso Fabius to the consulship, with Lucius Aemilius. This farther exasperated the people, who, by raising a sedition at home, encouraged foreign enemies to attack them. But war put a stop to intestine dissensions. The patricians and plebeians united, under the conduct of Aemilius, with little loss to themselves, overthrew and battered the Volscians and Equians, who had revived hostilities. On this occasion the enemy lost greater numbers during their retreat than in the battle, for after they were broken they were pursued by the cavalry to a vast distance. In the same year, on the Ides of July, the temple of Castor was dedicated. It had been vowed, during the Latine War, by Postumius the dictator, and his son, being appointed Dumvir for the purpose, performed the dedication. This year also the people were tempted to new exertions by the charms of the agrarian law. The tribunes wished to enhance the importance of their office by promoting that popular decree. The patricians, convinced that the multitude were, of themselves, too much inclined to desperate measures, looked with horror on such largesses, as incitements to acts of temerity, and they found in the consuls leaders as active as they could wish in opposing those proceedings. Their party consequently prevailed, and that not only for the present, but they were unable to appoint as consuls for the approaching year Marcus Fabius, brother to Caso, and Lucius Ferris, who was still more odious to the plebeians, on account of his having been the persecutor of Spurius Cassius. In that consulship there was another contest with the tribunes. The law in question was considered as a vain project, and the proposers of it disregarded as claiming merit from holding out to the people's view, advantages which were not attainable. The name of Fabius was now held in the highest estimation after three successive consulates, all of which had been uniformly distinguished by opposition to the Tribunitian power, and, for that reason, this dignity was continued in the same family for a considerable time, from a general persuasion that it could not be placed in better hands. Soon after this, war was undertaken against the Vienetians. The Volscians also renewed hostilities. For security against foreign enemies, the strength of the Romans was more than sufficient, but they perverted it to a bad purpose, namely, to the support of quarrels among themselves. To add to the general disquiet, several prodigies appeared, the sky almost daily exhibiting threatening portents, both in the city and in the country. The soothsayers, employed as well by the state as by private persons, after consulting both entrails and birds, 
declared that no other cause of the displeasure of the city existed than that the worship of the gods was not duly performed. All their apprehensions, however, ended in this. Alpia, a vestal, was convicted of a breach of chastity, and suffered punishment. Quintus Fabius, a second time, and Caius Julius, then succeeded to the consulship. During this year, the domestic dissensions abated not of their acrimony, and the war abroad wore a more dangerous aspect. The Equians took up arms. The Vienetians even carried their depredations into the territories of the Romans. And as these wars appeared every day more alarming, Caeso Fabius and Spurius Furius were made consuls. The Equians laid siege to Ortona, a Latin city. The Vientians, now satiated with booty, threatened to besiege Rome itself. Yet all these dangers which surrounded them, instead of restraining the ill-humor of the commons, only served to augment it. They resumed the practice of refusing to enlist as soldiers, not indeed of their own accord, but by the advice of Spurius Licinius, a plebeian tribune, who, thinking that this was the time to force the agrarian law on the patricians, when it would be impossible for them to make opposition, had undertaken to obstruct the preparations for war. However, all the odium excited by this exertion of the tribunitian power rested solely on the author, nor did the consuls unite their efforts against him with more eager zeal than did his own colleagues, by whose assistance the levy was completed. Armies were raised for the two wars at the same time. The command of one was given to Fabius, to be led against the Equians, of the other to Furius against the Vienetians. In the expedition against the latter, nothing memorable was performed. Fabius met with a great deal more trouble from his countrymen than from the enemy. That single man, by his conduct, as consul, supported the commonwealth, which the troops, out of aversion to him as far as lay in their power, treacherously betrayed to ruin, for after numberless other instances of his military skill, which he had displayed both in his preparatory measures and in his operations on the field, and when he had made such a disposition of his forces, that by a charge of his cavalry alone he put the enemy to rout, the infantry refused to pursue their broken troops, nor could any motive, not to mention the exhortations of the general whom they hated, nor even the immediate consequence of infamy to themselves, and disgrace to the public, nor the danger to which they would be exposed, should the enemy resume their courage, prevail on them to quicken their pace, or even to stand in order of battle, so as to resist an attack. Without orders they faced about, and with countenances as dejected as though they had been vanquished retired to their camp, execrating, at one time, the general, at another, the exertions of the cavalry. The consul, however, sought not any remedy against so pestilent an example, showing by one instance among many that men of the most transcendent abilities are more apt to be deficient in regard to the discipline of their own troops than in conquering an enemy. Fabius returned to Rome, having reaped little fresh glory from the war, but having irritated and exasperated, to a high degree, the hatred of the soldiers against him. The patricians, notwithstanding, had influence enough to continue the consulship in the Fabian family. They elected Marcus Fabius to that office, and Cineas Manlius was appointed his colleague. End of Book 2, Part 7